Today, I'm really excited to have two experts in platforms, strategy and business model, network effects, and network economics to talk about using data, especially data network effects, to build competitive edge. They co-authored the Harvard Business Review article, When Does Data Create Competitive Edge and When It Doesn't? We will explore the six questions that you can ask yourself to evaluate if your data-enabled learning will actually build moats and create sustainable growth. So let's start with a brief introduction about what you're working on and what led the two of you to collaborate on this. Sure, so I can start. I'm uh, based in Singapore, the National University of Singapore. Um, and we've been working on uh, platforms and uh, network effects and businesses that build on network effects for many, many years, maybe starting around 2000. Um, so, you know, 21 years. And of course, these were not so hot when we started, or at least when I started working on it. But um, over the last few years, you know, there's been this massive increase in interest in platforms. And one of the interests, interesting aspects of them is their use of data, right? And data to give them a competitive advantage. So Andre and I have been working together for quite a long time. Um, we met at a conference in France and uh, the, this, you know, this is one of our most interesting projects that we're still working on, um, which is, you know, many different aspects of how, not just how data gives you competitive advantage, but also some of the policy implications surrounding the use of data by, by incumbents. I'm, uh, I've been working mostly with Julian. I would say we're close to a monogamous relationship, research relationship uh, for, uh, for, uh, for quite a few years now. So I'm based in Boston, actually. So yeah, we met at a conference in France and you know, because we had very similar research interests, we started working together about 10 years ago on platforms. So at this point, I think what's really exciting, like what drives both of us is I think we do uh, essentially cover the entire value chain of ideas. That's how I like to think about it. So we do economics research. So you know, we publish like economics articles. Uh, we do some consulting for large companies. We also work on pub, uh, public policy issues. And then more recently, we, we've also started angel investing in startups, which are platforms or which, which have elements of data enabled learning. So, I mean, it's, it, it's a pretty, uh, I guess it's a pretty unique and exciting position to be in, in the sense of like, you know, cover, being able to cover all aspects of, uh, of, these, um, of these ideas. I'm more a practitioner, so I work with startups, scale-ups, and growth companies to help them with strategy and execution. And what I'm seeing is more and more AIs and data startups claiming how data is giving them the edge. And your article really gives me a frame to question if their claims has any legs. So let's dig in by setting the context first of what has changed part that's most uh, significant in terms of changes with data-enabled learning is simply the speed and the scope uh, with which we use data-enabled learning today. So in itself, learning, so using data to learn from customers is not a very new phenomenon. I mean, companies have been learning from their customers for decades. The issue is that that process used to be very slow and actually pretty limited. So they would do customers, you know, they would sell products and they would try to do customer surveys from a pretty limited set of customers. And they'd say, what do you like about the product? What do you not like about it? And then eventually the feedback they got from customers with the data would make its way into future versions of the products, but that happened much later. I think what's again, what's really significant to, in the past, I don't know, past decade, especially in the past few years, is that process has sped up significantly, especially, of course, with software products, to the point that now these products are learning almost in real time. So customers use the software products. The software product provider gets the data from customers, and they're, all, they're able to improve the product based on the, the data they obtain from customers almost instantaneously. Uh, again, using machine learning, using uh, using artificial intelligence. So that again, that that's why it's become such a huge part of how companies compete now. Because a lot of these products are digital, digital. Um, there's a scope to personalize the products. So previously, you know, whatever you were learning, we were sort of learning for the whole group. So your next version of the car would have some improvement, and everyone who bought that car would get that same improvement. But now with these um, insights that you can get that are customer specific. You can create a version of the product for every different type of customer. 
And so that, so that sort of personalization was not a feature of uh, learning from customers in the past, but has become much more important nowadays. Maybe let's clarify what is data enabled learning and what it, what, and what it encompasses and what it does not. Because with AI and machine learning companies, there is a natural assumption that they will have the data enabled learning or data net effects. Um, when, we th when we think of data enabled learning, what we have in our mind is actually uh, somewhat specific. So first of all, it has to be learning from customer data. And obviously you can learn a lot of stuff through machine learning, which comes from other data sources, right? And we wouldn't call that data enabled learning. Uh, because we have something very specific in mind. And that is that you learn from your customer data, you improve your product, and that generates more customers and more data, and therefore more learning and so on and so forth. So we have this virtuous cycle. And so when we talk about data enabled learning, we have in mind that virtuous cycle, something like you'd see on, say, using Google Maps. You know, more, more people use Google Maps when they're driving. So that gives you better traffic information, better predictions that makes a better product, more people use it, and so on. So that when we talk about data enabled learning, that's exactly what we have in mind. So it may be with or without machine learning. Uh, it's possible to think of examples where you don't use machine learning to do that. Of course, machine learning makes that much more powerful. The insights you get can be personalized, they can be obtained very uh, quickly, and also the predictions are more accurate, right? But it's, that's just sort of a, a matter of degree. Yeah, so just to, again, to make the contrast very clear, so like Julian defined data, and I think it, we really need to emphasize this. It's a very specific process. So it's truly data-enabled learning. We have to have in mind this virtuous cycle. And we would, we would contrast this with say, in some cases you can buy data. So instead of getting it from your customers, from serving customers, it is possible to just buy data sets, right? From other sources. And of course, you can use machine learning and artificial intelligence to learn from the from that data. Now, that is not data-enabled learning in the sense that we use the term, because obviously anyone, irrespective of how many customers they have, in principle, can have access to these external data sets. So that doesn't lead to this to this feedback loop that we are primarily focusing on. Um, the reason we're so interested in this feedback loop. Uh, and the concept of data-enabled learning is because that's where the sort of long-term sustainable advantage comes from, actually the accumulating advantage that a firm would get. Because if you can just go out and buy the data and you know, do your machine learning on it and come up with some improvement, then obviously anyone with resources, with money can go and do that. And you're not getting a, a long-term advantage from, from doing that. Although it's still maybe something you want to do, it's just not going to give you a uh, long-term and accumulating advantage. I think one of the premise in the article was that there is a difference between the whole virtual cycle of data network effects versus the regular network effects virtual cycle. So could you please elaborate more on that? Sure, uh, so I can start on this. Um, so the, the virtual cycle associated with data-enabled learning, like Julian described, very simply put, is a firm gets more customers, it learns from those customers, therefore it's able to improve the product. And by improving the product, it attracts more customers and so on and so forth, right? That's how the, 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 the self-reinforcing virtual cycle works. Now, that looks very similar to the traditional virtual cycle associated with network effects. So think businesses like Facebook or Airbnb or Uber, and the network effect there is a bit more direct in the following sense. So if more people use Facebook, well, the value to users of Facebook increases, right? Because directly, because I want to interact with these people. And again, more people get on Facebook, the more, the more valuable it is, and therefore more people go to Facebook and so on. So that's another, that's a very, in some sense, a very similar virtuous cycle. And the point that we're making in the article is that these two, these two virtual cycles, the one that's, that is due to data-enabled learning and the one that's due to network effects, they're very similar. And in some cases, they're combined. For example, Facebook does also have data and some data enabled learning. But it is very useful to distinguish between them because in some cases, if you only say you can have either only data enabled learning or only network effects, well, our one of the one of the points we make in the article is that typically comparative advantage tends to be stronger with traditional network effects relative to data enabled learning. And we can talk about why. Okay. Let's get into the six key points or questions that you use to ask if the data-enabled learning create moats. Let's have the first one. 
first one is probably the most important one, um, which is just to sort of ask the question, does the data, this customer data really add a lot of value compared to the product itself, right? So obviously, if you're talking about a product where the data, the, the, the value you get from learning from customer data is quite minor compared to the value of the product, then you know, you're just not going to get that much advantage from this virtual cycle. Uh, so we have in mind, for, for instance, the example of a smart TV. You know, a smart TV could, of course, um, look at your use of the TV to learn like which types of programs you like to watch and make recommendations a bit like Netflix does. But, you know, most people when they're buying a smart TV, they're not thinking about, well, is it going to help me, you know, find which shows I want to watch? They're more interested in, you know, is it, uh, does it have high resolution? Is the color good? Uh, is it big enough, the right size, you know, and so on and so forth. So uh, you can contrast that with an example like um, autonomous vehicles, right? Like if autonomous vehicles don't learn um, well how to, you know, react to various obstacles on the road and what to do, you just don't want to get in that car, right? Like you're not going to, when you're considering which autonomous vehicle you're going to get, your primary concern is how well has it learned from the data and able to predict uh, to different circumstances. So there the whole value is pretty much in the uh, quality of the learning from the data and not so much about the actual car design and car features. And of course, most examples will fall somewhere in between these two extremes that Julian described, right? So again, as angel investors, we've actually seen this ourselves. You know, pretty much every other company these days claims that they have, they use AI and machine learning to learn from their customers. And it's actually quite amazing how many of those claims you can pretty much refute just, I mean, by asking one of the six questions, but even by asking this first fundamental question, like how much value do you truly add with the data to the standalone value of the product? It's important to keep in mind we're talking about the value that's added. Right, because again, a lot of people will say, well, you know, with this data, we've improved our accuracy, you know, and um, how much they've improved the accuracy of their predictions. But if you think about the value created by autonomous vehicles, you know, if they improve the accuracy from 90 to 95%, or even 95% to 98%, there's still not much value for a consumer because they don't want to get in the vehicle until it gets to 99.999% accuracy. Right. So it's not about like how much incremental accuracy, improvement in accuracy you can provide is how much sort of value are you providing to the end user? And there's a, you know, we've seen other analysts look at this and they talk about, well, there's not much um, improvement in accuracy. It peters out at some level and so on. Um, and just to keep in mind, when we talk about this question, we focus on the value that's actually being contributed. Would you say that it's about if the data is actually adding value to the value proposition of the product itself then? Yes, that is ultimately, that is the, the, the main thing that matters. So it's not so much, I mean, again, this is something you probably see a lot of companies. They say, oh, look, we've improved our accuracy or some other measure by using, you know, by this much. Well, ultimately, I think the, the, um, the right metric should be how much more willingness to pay or how much utility have we added to our customers. That's, that's what you care about. And like Julian described, there are cases in which, you know, you may say like the accuracy maybe just improved from 99.9% to 99.92%. And you may say that's, that's tiny in terms of accuracy, but in terms of value to customers, it may be enormous, right? Because we're talking about say saving human lives. So, you know, if the, 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 the autonomous vehicle is 0.002% more accurate, that's actually very significant value. Yes, which is what I think leads to your initial uh, pre, uh, point on the article, which is what everybody is saying data is the new oil, right? Uh, but then it is like they grossly really overestimate the competitive edge that data actually brings. That's exactly right. Let's talk about the next question to ask then. The next question we ask is how quickly does the so the marginal value drop off or depreciate. So, um, and this is again, where it's important to think about value and not accuracy. So uh, we have in mind situations where it could be that you get quite a bit of learning from the data, but you get that learning very quickly, right? Like you just need a few hundred customers and you can get most of the insights 
and at that point you've improved your product and you've got everything out of it and you can't do any further improvement okay and that would be an example where the so marginal value learning drops off very quickly and an example we have in mind like that might be something like a smart device like a nest thermostat right where it learns your temperature setting after you've used it a few times um, and really there's not a lot of additional learning beyond that and that's important because it means this virtuous cycle kind of runs out very quickly you know i've I've learned a little bit, I've improved the product, but now there's no further gains to be made. And that's in contrast to applications like the autonomous vehicle, but there are other many others where um, the, the learning continues for a long time because actually there are many edge cases you have to deal with. And so you really need a lot of customer data and you need that cycle to go on for a long time until you really have exhausted all the learning from the data. Um, so, you know, one example I'd use in my teaching on this topic is um, credit scoring. So, you know, when you do credit scoring, you actually need a lot of data because there are many edge cases and you only find out about these edge cases when the customer goes broke, right? Like there's a default uh, and those defaults don't happen so often. They may only happen under extreme circumstances or in different macro environments. And so really the learning is a long process. And that means if you if you have an advantage and you're getting more data, you know, that accumulates over a long time. It's hard for another firm that comes in that's new to compete with that because they have a very long period of learning ahead of them. Ultimately, we care about value to customers. And also what we care about is whether data enabled learning in the particular context at hand can actually lead to defensible a defensible position or competitive advantage for the firm that benefits from that data enabled learning. So if we focus on this idea that, well, in order to have competitive advantage, like the value, the marginal value of data should actually remain high in order for you to actually still benefit from getting more customers, a good heuristic to say to, to, to figure that out would be exactly what Julian described, which is, are there a lot of edge cases in that particular application? So credit scoring is a good one. The other examples that I had in mind was, uh, for example, search. Like you can ask, like why has been why is Google Search so dominant? I mean, why have they been able to sustain their advantage for like for decades now? Why is it so hard to compete? Well, it's a, a lot of it has to do with it's it basically there's like billions of searches every day, and there's lots of long tail esoteric searches, and then Google is the only one. I think they they're the best that basically figure that you know they they have enough data to actually cover all these edge cases. I mean, Microsoft has spent billions of dollars with Bing. And I'm sure Bing is actually okay on, on very common searches, but I think the difference between the two is gonna be at these uh, long tail edge cases where again, Google benefits from a lot more data. Well, Andre just described this illustrates the discussion we we're having before about the difference between value and accuracy, because you know Google search and Bing search in terms of accuracy, they may not, they may differ only you know, by a few percentage points. Right. In some sense, for all these normal searches, they, they're both quite reasonable in terms of giving results. But all these edge cases, which may only account for a small you know, a few percent in accuracy, they can actually derive, or they can make a big difference in terms of value right, for a user. Because what they really care about is you know, that they get some results to these more difficult questions when they're doing their search. So that, and similarly with the credit scoring or the autonomous vehicle, again, like that difference in accuracy um, you know, it may be that you reach that point where you're not getting much gain in accuracy, but you're still getting a lot of gain, marginal gain in value, right? So when we ask this question, we're focused on does the marginal value of learning continue, you know, as you get more and more data, not whether the accuracy goes up by much, because that may actually getting be asymptoting, right? So what are you trying to say is that the additional usage data or, you know, data that comes from the usage itself or from customer does not lead to further insights or improvement. That's right. So, I mean, the to, to bottom line is if you only need a small number of customers to basically get most of the learning that you need to improve the product, then that doesn't lead to a very sustainable competitive advantage because it means another competitor can come in, obtain, you know, the very small required number of customers to get, you know, to get most of the learning. So versus a situation in which you need a lot of customers, a lot of past sales in order to learn, well, someone that has a head start actually will continue to, in principle, even if they don't screw up, in principle, their advantage will keep accumulating and it will be very hard for competitors to catch up.
this of course is good news if you're the incumbent right and you're an industry where you have this you know uh, situation where marginal value does not drop for a long time right but it's bad news if you're an entrant right you come into a market where there is an incumbent and you face the situation where you know it's autonomous vehicles or something like that and everyone else is way ahead and it's going to take you you know, millions and millions of customers to catch up in terms of getting the data insights. So what you're saying is that in this scenario, actually having a first mover advantage is important for them to have basically the head start. And what you say about the edge cases is actually quite interesting because I think as you put it, what it does is it actually allows them to gather the broad and the breadth and cover the huge volume of possibilities and scenarios and capturing the long tail, as you say, you know, that well, that majority would not be able to capture because they will only be catering to the common 80% and not the 20%. That is just as important and valuable. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, the third one, what will be the third question to ask then? The third question is how fast does the relevance of the data that you get from customers depreciate? Actually, we can use the same example that we just used. I like think of Google search. I mean, part of the reason that like another way to think about the, uh, the reason that Google search has been dominant is the fact that searches that were done on Google, say 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, the, so the, the information, the data that Google gets from those searches is actually, most of it is still relevant today. Now, I'm sure, you know, there's, if you, if you look at the data, I'm sure there's certain types of searches that are new, that come, there's new types of searches that, you know, come on, come all the time. I'm sure we can make a lot of jokes about like, what, what are the common searches today versus 10 years ago and things like that. But overall, it accumulates, right? So there's still a relevance. So all the data that Google acquired even like 15 years ago is still relevant today. So that's very good for competitive advantage. If the data does not depreciate, the value from the data does not depreciate fast, that's good. Like it, it's good for, for the incumbent, for someone that has a head start. On the other hand, if the relevance of the data depreciates very quickly, then uh, data enabled learning cannot sustain uh, a very defensible positions. Uh, I think an example we had in mind, I can't remember what we talked about in the article, I think it was social gaming. So this was like uh, the example of Zynga and others. I mean, you know, if with social gaming, for example, you can have a hit, so it's, it's quite difficult. I mean, it's very difficult to have a, a, a hit social game. But the point is once you have that hit, you're basically trying to replicate it. It's actually very difficult because consumer fads change very quickly. So whatever was relevant, whatever you learned say five years ago, and you know you had massive success with one social game, may become completely irrelevant. You know, just a few years later, because consumer preferences have shifted. So you have to you basically started from scratch. Another example would be Google Maps. This is an example where the data depreciates very very quickly. Um, it's an interesting example because obviously Google Maps does have a strong competitive advantage, and we'll, we can bring up you know the reasons for that later in a, with respect to another question, but at least in terms of this dimension, in terms of data depreciation, you know, the data that you collect on traffic uh, obviously depreciates very quickly and is not so relevant the next day. Of course, it is still useful for predicting on average the traffic conditions at a certain hour. Um, but if I want to know the current conditions on a particular road, right, knowing what Google knew yesterday is not that relevant. So the data is always depreciating and of course, Google is also Google Maps is also continuously collecting new data, so it's, it's sort of able to learn continuously. But it would mean that if someone else came along and had just as good traffic data, right? Like they can they can enter this market. They don't need a they don't need past traffic data. They just need current traffic data, and they can compete. Of course, it's um, difficult to get that data. Since they both sounds a bit similar as any additional usage does not lead to any further insights or improvement, why do you keep them as two separate questions? I was just going to point out one obvious difference and then maybe Andre can, can add on to that, which is um, the previous one is about sort of more about future data, right? Like as I collect more and more data, what happens to my learning? And this question is more about past data. Do I get value from my past data that I've collected? Do I continue to get value from it or does it just, that value disappear? So in the Google Maps example, that value just disappears tomorrow pretty much, right? Um, whereas in Google search, it lasts for a long time. 
And in fact, we can use, you can use the Google Maps example. So it does, in some sense, it's very, it does very poorly on this last point because the, the data depreciates very quickly, but I would argue it does very well on the previous point in which you know, the additional, I mean, you know, it actually, they do need quite a lot of users to figure out, you know, traffic conditions. So they are similar, but actually they can be like, in, you know, in some cases you may have one, but not the other. They're definitely not, they're definitely not synonymous. Uh, so the, the fourth one is asking, how, how easy or how difficult is it for competitors to copy the product improvements that, that are the results of data-enabled learning? So obviously, if, let's say, I learn from my customer's data, and then I translate that learning into some new features that I put into my product, if those features are easily observed by my customers and easily copied by my competitors and easily copied by my competitors, then I haven't obtained much advantage. I mean, it, 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 the data is very valuable, but in terms of competitive advantage, I'm, I haven't obtained anything, right? Because my, my competitors can just sit back, not even worry about learning from their customer data, just look at what I'm doing and then just copy the features that I have. Versus there are other situations in which whatever you learn from the data, it translates into improvements that are not easily observable from the outside, in particular by competitors. In that case, obviously, it's you know it's a much better situation to be in. So I think the example we gave for this latter better case would be something like, uh, suppose you provide software like you, you're so you're learning from from customers how to operate your call centers. Now this is very like backend process type of learning, which obviously will translate into a better experience for your customers. But it's impossible. There's none of the stuff is observable from the outside. It's impossible for a competitor to sit there and say, like, let me figure out how they've improved their uh, their customer experience. That's very different from, say, some software products, which certainly learn a lot from uh, from customers. But then it translates into features like which are everyone can observe. And then those features are easily copied. So there, like the data enabled learning doesn't doesn't provide much advantage. You could think of it, I guess, whether you can reverse engineer from the from the observable, you know, products or features, um, and in the call center, you can't really work out what they did to create this better user experience. You know, better, more friendly, and more helpful call center staff. Uh, whereas the other example with software, we can just look at the the nice features that it has and just copy them. You know, obviously, you don't need to do any reverse engineering. So, so in fact, actually, just occurred to me. Uh, there's probably like a nice way to sort of summarize this and have some like a how to say, a clear guideline for companies to think about. So if the data-enabled learning translates into improvements that are either some sort of back-end things or processes, that's good. That's, that's, not, that's, that's very difficult to copy or to reverse engineer. On the other hand, if the data-enabled learning translates into improvements that are front-end, i.e. features into the product, that's not as good because obviously that's that's that that's easier to copy. All other things equal, I prefer that the data enabled learning is something that actually improves the back end processes rather than the front end, you know, user features. Yeah, or basically what you're saying is that the improvement is maybe on the uh, differentiated activities or the secret sauce that lead to the attributes that make a difference to the customer experience in terms of the value proposition. Okay, so question here is how difficult is it to get some other um, data that you can use to get the same sort of insights? Um, in, some in some cases, that's going to be, there's going to be some other data set that's going to allow you to get the same kind of learning that you got from your own customer data. And in that case, you know, one company's painstakingly, you know, got all, made, gathered all this customer data, got the insights, built up an improved product. And if someone else can just go out and use an alternative data source that pretty much does the same thing and buy it, you know, then you're not really getting much competitive advantage. Um, as opposed to an example where your data is very unique, that you, your customer data is very unique and there's no, good alternative to that data. You can't go and buy something that is going to give you similar training data that you can use for your machine learning to get of similar insights. Um, so, you know, an example where I guess where you can get um, a lot of the data sort of there's, there's various versions that are available would be something like um, captions and subtitles, um, you know, like imagine you're trying to put on subtitles on your uh, social media or your, your videos or whatever, right? Um, nowadays, there's just so many ways you can get 
sources of data that would allow you to train models to, to create subtitles or caption um, voice. Um, and that's because there's just lots of publicly available data sources on both the spoken version and the, you know, the subtitles or captions for those. Like I can just go on YouTube, I can go on Netflix, I can go on all these different services and I can just see the spoken version and then the subtitles for those. And I can use that to train my models, right? So that, that's just readily available. Okay, let's go to number six because this is the one that I really got the best insight, the most insight for, right? So the question to ask for number six is: Well, let's hope that the way the the one that we have in mind is the one that you want. <laughs> so for number six, the one that we're thinking of is um, is the learning from user data within user or across users. Is that what you had in mind, Josephine? Awesome. Broadly speaking, the um, so the learn that you can get from customer data, there's two extreme cases. In one case, if Joseph, the more Josephine uses my products, the better the product becomes, but only for Josephine. So like I'm able to just figure out your preferences and give you exact the service of the product. I can customize it the way you want it. And, but it doesn't help with anyone else. Like it doesn't help me improve the product or the service to anyone else. So that's, that's what we call within user learning. So the data from one user only helps to improve the product or the service for that particular user. The polar opposite situation is in which everything I learned from a customer is actually relevant to everyone else. So here is I learned from Josephine, I learned from Julie, and I learned from a bunch of other people. And then I can improve the service or the product for everyone. So that's what we call a cross user learning. And of course, in many cases, you can think about there's probably a combination of these two types of learning. There's some within user learning and some across user learning. But if you focus on these pure, like these two pure cases, you can ask the question, which one's better? Is it better or other things equal to benefit from, uh, from data that helps mostly to, you know, to target uh, within user learning, so to, to improve the product for a specific user, or does it mostly help with a cross user learning? And they work actually, both can provide some competitive advantage, but they work quite differently. So in the situation in which the learning is mostly within user, it creates switching costs. So if whatever product or service I'm selling really gets a lot better, the more Josephine uses it, then she's gonna be very unlikely to switch to a new product just because my product has figured out her preferences, gives, exa gives her exactly what she wants. However, it doesn't really help so it's good. So that's kind of within user learning is very good to maintain, to, uh, to keep existing customers. You're not going to switch, but it doesn't really help in attracting new customers because if Julian's considering my product versus someone else, well, I don't really have an advantage, right? The only, if the only advantage I have is when Julian uses my product a lot, well, you know, if he's like, if he hasn't used my product, then there's like zero value to him versus the case in which there's a cross user learning. So when there's a cross user learning and the product truly learns across different users, then a new customer actually does benefit from learnings from the existing customers. So with the cross user learning, there's a lot more competitive advantage when it comes to attracting new customers. So I would think it basically, you know, there, there's a trade, I mean, there's a trade off. So if you're trying, you know, if, if you really, tr if you're trying to have very high switching costs, it means to keep your existing customers within user learning is great. However, if you're in a situation where it really matters is try to grow very fast and attract new customers across user learning is a lot better because that gives you a lot more, you know, it, it makes it a lot easier for you to attract new customers. So can you talk about the example of Spotify and Pandora? Because I think that really connect the dots much uh, better for a lot of people. Well, thank you very much for bringing it to my favorite topic, because I think I'm probably the only, the, remain, the only remaining Pandora user in the entire world. <laughs> so it's exactly what we're talking about. So Pandora, it's quite interesting. Pandora, I think as far as I know, it's still only available in the US. I mean, I guess you can get a VPN in Australia and Singapore, but it's a pain. So Pandora has been great. So they invented the music genome project, which is basically trying to categorize music and figuring out like different interesting relationships between different songs and types of music. And they developed this amazing recommender system, which figures out the more you listen to their music and the more you say like, I like this, but I don't like this. They're just very, very good at figuring out your preferences and figuring out other things that you might like. So you start listening to Pandora radio, they customize it to a degree that I find that amazing. So I love it. I absolutely love that product. And I've been using it for years. I'm unlikely to switch. 
And in fact, I have resisted to this day switching to Spotify precisely because there's so much within user uh, learning from Pandora. Spotify is quite different. I mean, I think they have some of that, but they're mostly, they mostly have traditional network effects and across user learning. So for example, they, they allow people to share playlists. So they've been much better at growing internationally, especially they're much larger than Pandora now. So I think it's a very, you know, it's a very, it's a very good illustration of the difference between the two. So Pandora has a, you know, an established, lo a very loyal user base. I guess I'm, I'm one of those, but Spotify has grown a lot faster. So, I mean, this is an example where I guess across user learning is obviously, uh, is obviously better. I, when we think about within user learning, we have in mind often um, the smart devices, right? Like we mentioned before, the Nest thermostat. I mean, that's just basically learning your, preferences for temperature. And that's pretty much mostly within user learning. My favorite example is the smart bed by Eight Sleep, um, which is, it learns your preferences for temperature throughout the night to give you the best possible sleep, right? And my preferences for temperature throughout the night could be very different from yours. And so it's, you know, mostly within user learning. There's probably some across user learning, but it's mostly within. And you can contrast that to our example previously of autonomous vehicles. Right, you would hope that the autonomous vehicles learning when it comes to predicting, you know, um, how to, or determining how to react to an object that comes out in front of the car is not personalized to who's who's driving the car. Right, you want that to work the same for any user who gets into the car. So that's pretty much across user learning. Um, and then I have an example of a tractor, an tra autonomous tractor. An autonomous tractor is interesting because autonomous tractor combines both of these things. Right, because a tractor works on a farm and the route that it's going to take is going to be the same you know, every day pretty much. So there's within user learning, it learns the route of the farm and all the obstacles on the farm very well. But it's also got a lot of across user learning because it, you know, it has to work when you know, maybe the farmer takes it to a different farm or to a different, certain, you know, different situation or there's something in the environment that changes. And those things it's learning from you know, all the other autonomous tractors out there. Uh, so it's, you know, there are when you think about each example, you can think about how much within user learning there is, how much across user learning, and how much combination of these things together. Well, if you can, it's great if you have both. Like we, I mean, we prefer as angel investors, I think we prefer companies that have both because obviously that you get the benefits of both types of competitive advantage. We've alluded to the fact that you have this virtuous cycle, right? Which is great. Um, and that you could think of as like a data network effect. You know, the more people use the product, the better it gets. And therefore, you know, the more people want to use it. Okay, it looks like a network effect. Um, but there's some subtle differences. Okay, and when we think about comparing regular network effects and data network effects, we think data network effects are generally not as powerful for a few reasons. Okay, and one is with, network, with regular network effects, um, often there's sort of a coordination problem which is people have to think about, well, what are other people going to do? Are they going to use this new type of um, product? So, you know, do I want to, do I want to switch to this much better new social network that doesn't have all these privacy concerns? Okay. Andre has one in mind uh, that he's looking at um, as opposed to using Facebook. Right. But would I switch? Well, that depends on whether everyone else would switch because there's not much use joining a new social network when no one else is there. Right. So there's that coordination problem. That coordination problem can also exist in with data network effects, okay? But it often doesn't. So an example where it, I think it does exist and which explains why Google Maps has a strong competitive advantage. Um, if you think about Google Maps, why is it each morning that I go to work, I use Google Maps? Well, because I, I expect that everyone else is using Google Maps and therefore the traffic predictions will be accurate, right? So it's that, it's that coordination of everyone using the same service. If a new mapping service comes out that actually has superior features, no one's gonna use it unless they think other people are gonna use it. Therein lies the coordination problem, right? And that's very similar to the same problem with, that, with regular network effects. And that's a very powerful advantage to have, right? But it's just that when we think about um, many examples of data network effects, they don't have that very strong uh, coordination problem. Partly because users are not very, they're not sort of consciously thinking about, well, is this product going to get better because as more other people use it? They're not thinking like that. They're just thinking, is this product better today than some other product, right? They're not making that sort of forward-looking uh, decision. 
when they come to use the product. So that's one difference. The other, of course, difference is if you just have within user learning and you don't have across user learning, then there is no network effect, no data network effect, right? The only way you get data network effect is if the product gets better as more other people use it. But if it's just within user learning, it's just personalized to each person, it's not getting better for you as more other people use it, right? So my, my uh, NAS thermostat doesn't get more accurate for me just because Andre and Josephine are using it, right? So that's an example where, you know, you have data enabled learning, but you don't have a network effect. So basically what you're saying is that um, on the last point about within and across user learning, if the learning is actually across user, that is when the data enabled learning will have the regular network effects. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's right. Like you really need a cross user learning to have any hope of having data network effect. And ideally you have both. That's um, that's even better. Um, but if you just have within user learning, you're not going to get anything like a network effect. So I would add, so just again, to drive this point, to drive some of these points home, like perhaps even more forcefully. I mean, one way to think about it is so the difference between regular network effects and data network effects and regular network effects this particular thing about the social network example, I really care directly, immediately, who else is on the social network. Like, I, that's, that's the only thing that matters, right? Like Julian described with data-enabled learning, I actually don't really care per se who else is using the product. The only reason I care about it, I may care about it, is because, well, other people make the product better for me. But again, like Julian explained, well, you know, most people probably don't understand this. Most people don't really think about, like, well, I'm going to use Google search because it has more users and therefore it learns faster. They just probably use it because, well, it's just really good and presumably it's better than Bing for their obscure questions. And another way to think about, I would say another way to think about it is linking to one of the points we made earlier with data enabled learning, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes you can kind of like find ways to get data to help you overcome the initial uh, the initial shortage of, you know, of data from customers. So like if you can find a data set that helps you overcome the fact that you don't have a lot of customers, that actually helps. So you can buy basic, you can buy your way to some learning by buying data sets and you don't have a lot of customers. With regular network effects, you just can't do that. I mean, I guess you can buy customers, but there's basically no way around it. Like you can't just go and buy data sets. You just need those customers. So again, if I have a social network, there's no way I can go and buy some data. I just need to attract other customers. So that's in this sense is what Julian explained, which I think is very important, is the, the part that there's a coordination problem. And that coordination problem can create much stronger competitive advantage with regular network effects than with data network effects. Again, you can have data network effects or you can have traditional network effects. Traditional network effects, what we mean is the ones like we talked about for Facebook. I think one of the summary of the article is that the companies that has both data network effects and regular network effects tend to have the strongest competitive edge. Yes, of course, regular or traditional network effects, in most cases, tend to provide stronger competitive advantage than data network effects. But, you know, in the words of Tony Stark, I think it was in uh, Iron Man 1, it's like, is it too much to ask for both? Like, you know, if I could, like, why do I have to choose between the two, right? So ideally, if I'm an investor, I would prefer to invest in a company that is both, that has both traditional network effects and data network effects. So say, you know, and in fact, the very big tech companies, the ones that are very successful, they do have both. So think about Facebook, Think about Airbnb. So they have regular network effects in the sense, you know, the more hosts they have, the better is for travelers and vice versa. And they have data network effects because obviously the more, you know, they, the more customers they serve, the better the product gets for customers. They can make better recommendations. They, they can learn how to, uh, how to adjust the prices and, and so on. So, you know, again, if, if, I can, if I can combine the two, that actually has a chance of providing very strong competitive advantage. Is this like the network effect as well as data enabled learning, something that is a key characteristic that belongs that only a platform business model actually enjoy? To be very, to do it very briefly, um, the way, and there's lots, lots of companies, lots of people have very um, vague definitions or notions of platforms. The way we think about it, a platform business is a business that connects customers. It could be multiple types of customers. So almost by definition, 
platform businesses have traditional network effects. So something like Uber is a platform business. It connects drivers to uh, passengers. Airbnb is a platform. Facebook is a platform. So the only, I mean, I guess the requirement there is that there's, you know, I, I'm creating connections or I'm enabling interactions between these customers. So network effects, traditional network effects are the quintessential characteristic of platform businesses. Data network effects are not required, but they can, again, if they are present, they make things even better. Okay, so what you're saying is that for the platform model itself, you know, the network effects are usually part of a characteristic of why it makes platform, you know, business model so interesting and actually difficult to build, right? And therefore, it is the secret sauce that give platform model the competitive edge that give them the sustainable growth that even after they have successfully built it, it's really difficult to uh, it's really difficult to unseat them because they don't even have to do anything much because the network effect itself, you know, allow the edge to continue and to grow and to retain the customer and to retain its advantage. That's exactly right. So as one, I think uh, it was the, um, the founder of Intuit. Uh, I had a conversation with him. The way he likes to talk about this is, is basically to say the reason I like network effects or platform businesses with network effects is because they basically get better when I sleep. And I think that pretty much summarizes it, right? So unlike a traditional product business, if you wanna get more customers or if you want the product to get better, there's, you actually have to do the work, right? I mean, you have to improve, put, put out new features. With platforms and network effects, I mean, part, by the way, no one says you shouldn't actually try to have new features. Of course you should do that. But even if you stopped, right? Even if tomorrow I stop improving the platform, it can still get better just by virtue of there's customers participating and because more customers participate, that makes the product better for all the other customers precisely because they care about the presence of everyone else. I think one of the insights that, uh, that was there in your article that platform model really gets a few profit margins by doing very little, which is, where it's, which is something that's so attractive. So they grow very fast and they have relative very low um, cost structures precisely because I'm in the business. So if I'm a platform business, I'm just enabling interaction. So think about something like Airbnb, compare Airbnb to hotels. Airbnb is just pure software, right? I mean, it's amazing. Like they don't own any, they don't have to own houses or hotels or anything. They're just allowing people that have houses or whatever, like apartments to rent them out to others versus a hotel chain, which actually has to, own inventory. Same thing, compare Uber with taxi companies, right? Uber is just pure software. They don't, they don't have to own cars. Exactly. So is this the reason why you're so fascinated with platform? Yeah, I think like Julian, uh, I came to, uh, to the world of platforms by recognizing pretty early on that platform businesses uh, raise some very interesting issues. So, you know, there's some very specific characteristics that are associated with platforms. And yes, they do create this kind of, I mean, they tend to get very large, they're very important and, you know, we can see, I mean, there's something intrinsically interesting about it. But I would also say, you know, I've also noticed that they tend to be very, uh, how to say, uh, when they succeed, they tend to be financially very successful. So obviously as an angel investor, I would very much like to be able to identify the next big platform businesses. So yeah, I think if you just say like, I'm just gonna invest in platforms, that's probably a decent, you know, it's a decent strategy and you have, you have a chance at outsized returns again, given how powerful platform business models can be. So um, like I have one client who actually is just listed last year on a stock exchange here and they are a platform business and one of the fastest growing startup as well as one of the bigger platform marketplace or platform business actually in Australia. Um, I have a startup who's currently in the process of building a platform business as well. However, you know, as you know, and is written in the article as well, it's not easy to build one, right? If you manage to be successful with it, you'll be very successful with it. But it's a lot money. harder. It's a lot harder. I mean, I think, of course, this is like, you know, they're in life, they're trade-offs, right? I mean, yes, if, if successful, it's much more successful than the average product business. Like there's no question, but obviously it's a lot more difficult to build than traditional product businesses, precisely because you have network effects, which like you have to get past the initial chicken and egg problem. It's very, very, and there's lots of, by the way, there's lots of other things that can go wrong, but yeah, I mean, it's it's actually very very difficult. So, what is the best way for uh, readers and an audience to either either get your content, reach you, or actually find your content? Uh, so, I think the best way for both Julian and I is to go see our Substack newsletter. So, Platform Chronicles 
dot substack dot com can uh, can subscribe to our newsletter. We put out an article every two weeks. Hopefully, we'll have a further discussion more in detail with regards to moving from a product to a platform business, as well as you know what defines a platform, what makes a platform, you know how to make a platform and build one actually that that is successful. So yes, we do cover in great depth what, what what you just mentioned. So how to turn traditional products or services into platforms. We'll talk about how to you know the main challenges when you're starting platform businesses and so on. The the goal here was we're basically trying to cover every single interesting aspect about the business of platforms. So with that, I think、um, that end our today's discussion.